I, I do want to uh, begin to get this started. Uh, we're a little bit behind already, but that's okay. Uh, just want to talk about the agenda for this evening. Uh, you know, again, this is the local planning committee meeting number two. Uh, we do have a, a lot to go over. Uh, just so you all know, which I'm sure you do know, it's been just over three weeks since uh, we had our first uh, planning committee meeting and quite a bit has happened in that month. Another example of sort of the pace at which the, the DRIs are going. The, you know, the first thing that we want to get to is the, the code of conduct and, the, uh, and Jamie from the Department of State is going to go through that. The uh, planning progress report, I will go through that. And then I want to get into a you know, real work session conversation with the planning committee tonight just about you know, the development of confirmation of the vision, a confirmation of the study area boundaries, which came out of the, uh, the first planning committee meeting, and, and then really talk about the development of the goals that are being built out of what the community has you know, uh, said to us and the priorities that are coming out of this. And you know, then we get into the preliminary projects um, and you know, during that, we're going to have Department of State speak again, just to give a clarification about the, the DRI projects, what they are, um, what constitutes a, a strong candidate for a DRI project, and then some of the conversations that have been coming through all of this. Because again, in a fast-paced manner, we also create, you know, there's moments of confusion, things are going quickly, so we want to make sure um, that we are, you know, really keeping track of everything that we need to. And we'll go into quickly the next steps and then the public at the end we include you know up to 15 minutes at the end of this meeting for anyone from the community to speak based on the conversations and the discussions tonight and i realize that i have jumped forward on the agenda and i'm looking at the mayor as well with the, her your introduction and you know again I, what i would like to do is just to pass the microphone around um, so, you know, I know many of the planning committee members know each other, but just so that the community um, behind knows who is up and a part of the planning committee and represents tonight. So I'm just going to pass it starting here. Hi, Christine Vanderland, Columbia Land Conservancy. Colin Stair, Stair Galleries. Dan Seward, John Doe Books and Records. Uh, Michael Sadowski, Bard Early College, Hudson. John Riley, Chairman, Economic Dell. Committee of the Board of Supervisors. Bob Lucky of the Cascades. Christian Ludwig, City of Hudson. Sarah Kendall, Kaisness. Peter Young, Art Gallery. Todd Erling, Hudson Valley Agribusiness. Matthew Nelson, Co-Chair. Lee Hamilton, Co-Chair. Michelle Gates, National Land Farmers Association. Betsy Gramco, Columbia Green Hospital Foundation. Tony Jones, Columbia Economic Development. Kim <laughs> Bach, Verda Green Tea and Chocolate. Brenda Adams, Columbia County Habitat. <coughs> Antonio Habitat, Principal at Hudson High School. Jeffrey Hunt, Columbia County Chamber of Commerce. Randall Martin, Hudson Housing Authority. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right, and uh, really, again, a little bit of the um, housekeeping, but I'd like to have Jamie come up here and just speak to the, the code of conduct. This is an important component for this. Uh, it was mentioned at the first meeting, but we need to make sure that this is taken care of. So with that, here you go. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you again for volunteering, so to say, to be on this uh, committee, the local planning committee. So uh, at your spaces, you will see, and it may have been emailed to you as well, is a code of conduct form. And uh, simply put, it's, um, it's for you to, to disclose any, uh, any potential conflict of interest that may uh, come up throughout the process, any concerns, any uh, perceived conflict of interest. As we move through the planning process, there may be projects identified that may benefit you directly. Uh, and so if that is the case, then we just ask you to uh, recuse yourself from votes. And essentially, the only vote that comes up is at the very end of the process when there will be a list of projects that will be recommended to the state for funding under DRI. And so if you directly benefit from those projects, we ask that you recuse yourself from voting on that particular project. 
And so essentially, uh, great slide, disclose any conflicts of interest. If there's anything that comes up that's a concern, that's a uh, maybe a perceived conflict that you may that you may think may be there, certainly bring it up to the committee and just say, hey, I, I want everybody to know that uh, I want to disclose that I have some some benefit in this project or some uh, role in this particular project. And certainly, uh, you're all going to be acting in the public interest as we move forward. And then if, uh, if needed, like I said, you can just recuse yourself. So essentially, uh, this spells out all the uh, potential areas where there may be any conflict of interest. If you have any questions, certainly you can ask me. If it goes beyond me and we need to get counsel involved, certainly I can refer you to our ethics counsel at the Department of State. Uh, but other than that, take a look at it. If you want to think about it and sign and bring it back next time, uh, you can certainly do so. But otherwise, if it's simply put, you can sign and hand it to me. I would really appreciate it. And if you don't have a, uh, a form at your, spy, at your space, please let me know. Thank you, David. So, uh, planning, you know, progress report where we're at. As I said, you know, we just started less than a month ago. You know, since then we had a public kickoff meeting. I'll get into some of the details of that in just a few minutes. Uh, we've been going through the series of stakeholder interviews. Uh, when I get to that slide, I know there's been some conversations about those stakeholder interviews, and I'll just clarify and we can, you know, and go through, you know, what's been going on with those. Um, we've done some market conditions, initial intakes um, from our sub-consultants on the team. Um, and then, you know, we've already created what are these draft deliverables that have gone to the Department of State. These will all shortly be available on the website and for review. But again, a community engagement plan, the meeting summaries, the kickoff summary, the downtown profile submitted. That is one rather large item, essentially the existing conditions that I, I did not include on the agenda tonight. Um, again, developing that piece. Uh, if there's questions about that, we can discuss it towards the end of this meeting. But really, it's more of an existing condition that I thought, you know, and everything else we want to talk about, I would hold that off for right now. Uh, and then again, the developing the preliminary project sheets, the ones that were from the application, those are now being transformed and vetted in, into the project profile, which is part of the DRI. But again, the preliminary is part of the discussion tonight. I just want to emphasize that. I also just want to take this one moment to the, the whole committee, and I told Todd yesterday that I wouldn't mention his name, but it's, it's a good point, you know, just about, you know, if there's any questions whatsoever on this process at any time, call me, email me or call me, I am available. Now, essentially, I'll say that to the community as well, but the fact of the matter is, the sooner anything's addressed, the better. And so it's just very, very helpful. And again, I am here throughout this process, so just call and get in touch with me. Um, you know, where we're at in terms of the timeline and the schedule. I've talked about some of these materials that we've already created and where we're at. I want to call out a couple, you know, important pieces on this. You know, we really need to get the goal, vision, goals, and strategies complete and complete over the next couple weeks. Uh, so again, emphasize the reason for tonight is to really focus on that. The important thing is when we look at the identified projects, the uh, DRI priority profile projects, you know, we need to have them identified uh, in December. So again, those, it's going to be another rapid month of making sure that all of those are in, and then we go through the revisions of those and we vet them and we de further develop them going forward. But you know, that, that you know, red line going right down you know, here in December, just, you know, really make note of that. So again, you know, as we go through this. The kickoff meeting. Uh, for everyone who was there, I think it was just a, a great event. Uh, we registered about 80 signed in individuals, 80 plus. I have a feeling for my counts that were at least 100 people who were at the event. And again, it was just really a great moment for the community to get together uh, and work um, in groups just to talk about what's most important to them. You know, we really heard a lot, and this is just a sampling, I won't read these, but you know, what I want to state is in all of the, the visioning, the comments, everything that was written down, all of that has been scanned, uh, it's been summarized into the engagement summary, kickoff summary, and all of it, again, has all gone into Department of State, it is, will all be available, I'm looking at Jamie right now, but essentially, now and we can upload it uh, to the website and and again i'll get to that website as we go in there but we've got places to store this and so it'll be available in a, in a couple locations for anyone who 
is interesting. But again, you know, these were some of the more common comments um, that we that we got. The representative, you know, from the individual vision statement feedback, um, this is what we, we began to rank. And again, the the year-round living, wage jobs, the affordable housing, waterfront access, transportation improvements workforce development, enjoyment of the waterfront, mixed income housing, and the emphasis on year-round uh, were all of the, the pieces. And in fact, you'll see those, some of these changes reflected. Uh, and again, access to healthy food, affordable housing, it, it, comes, it begins to repeat. We heard these reflected in the priorities from each of the communities as well. But again, it's always important to have that because I want, when we have this refined, I want those to be reflected in the vision statement for this. And then again, as I mentioned, getting people to work together, and for anyone who wasn't there, I mean, this was an opportunity to talk to your neighbors, community members, and to develop a very specific, you know, up to five priorities uh, from your table that you all shared. So again, creating the shared priorities. And you know, this is essentially where they really began to focus, you know, and we're sort of grouping them into these categories, but the you know, public transportation, you know, both within Hudson and connecting um, out, you know, groceries, et cetera, it, it, you know, important. The food access came up a number of times, um, both from the terms of the farmer's markets, other, you know, different food hubs, et cetera. Uh, vocational training, I, I should say, you know, probably workforce training as well, you know, all around um, became an important comment. Um, and again, just this a permanent access, improved access to the waterfront. The public beer project was just interesting and we listed it a, you know, as its own category because it was so prominent, and affordable housing because it was mentioned so many times. You know, again, those are their own you know categories, and we're really going to work into those. But again, just you know, so that we're seeing in the community shaping um, this effort. Just an example of the maps um, that each group was working on, and again, all of these have been scanned, and it will all soon be online. Rather large file, but we'll get it online. The stakeholder interviews. Uh, Point of clarification, because I, I realize there's been some confusion about who the stakeholders are, why some of, you know, we've reached out to some people and potentially not others. Uh, when we start almost any planning project, but this one in particular, you know, we need, we, the consulting team, need to get a sense of what's going on, sort of a pulse within the place that we are now going to spend a lot of time. Uh, so what I had done is I'd sent out a list of types of stakeholders who I thought were important. Property owners, business owners, uh, real estate, realtors, real estate experts, developers. I mean, those were some of the categories, community activists, community organizations, philanthropic entities. That was the list I provided to the city, to Sheena, et cetera. And from that, a list was generated. Um, the planning committee was emailed out, everyone who got onto that list. And then, you know, what I've got here is just, you know, in this table is who we've actually had a, a moment, a chance to speak with uh, but again, you know, really I wanted to make a focus on this, that, you know, it's for, it was their setup so that we could really as quickly as possible get a sense of what was important, what were the issues, the conflicts, the, you know, you're not going to change this, here's an opportunity over here, you really need to focus on it. And so in that, and it's been incredibly helpful, I'll go through a, a few of what we've heard so far. What I want to state though, you've got that list today, if there are other stakeholders who should be on that list, who we should be talking to as well, by all means, you know, that is something that we can continue to do. I mean, time is limited. We need to move right into the, you know, basically identifying the projects. But nonetheless, it's not, there's no sense of trying to exclude anyone in that. And I just want to, again, make that, you know, a priority. It was set up from that structure. Uh, just really kind of thinking about, you know, again, what we are hearing. The, you know, limited resources and policy is inconsistent. Again, you know, these are just, it's coming, it's what we're, we're reporting back. We haven't gone through this, we haven't vetted these, but these are issues, concerns that, you know, what is the capacity going to be when we're making recommendations for DRI? How can it be implemented? The, you know, this, the low income, high income constituencies, this divide, again, the communities have the same thing, but we're hearing from that, you know, issues like the high property taxes, and what that means to businesses on Warren Street and going forward, you know, who can be there, who's getting priced out. All of those are clearly, you know, the real concerns from business owners, property owners, you know, et cetera. 
And, you know, again, you know, this community serving anchor, you know, real estate in the city's capacity that came up a couple times, you know, year round farmers market and some of these other ideas, uh, you know, again, in inequity in terms of where the DRI funds, you know, need to go was clearly a theme that we heard just in terms of making sure that this is, you know, broadly considered a shared success. And, and again, lower rents, you know, how we do it, more affordable food options, um, that planning process and, um, and dealing supportive of development, it, you know, that was just something we wanted to think about. You know, this third wave of gentrifying businesses and entities, uh, you know, I heard it's not up here, but, you know, just, you know, even some of the newer transplants here are some of the ones who are most concerned about, you know, how quickly, you know, prices seem to be increasing. And, you know, that's important as we begin to think about these. And, you know, the fact that, you know, it's not right in here, but again, when we talk about the upper stories, you know, oftentimes they're, they're something not turning over, the prices are getting higher. There's also limited opportunities for, you know, work space, office space within the area. And so again, how can we start to bring those into it? Uh, I, I, I just ignored some of the resiliency issues, flooding, uh, you know, again, those are all, you know, how we address those in any type of development. I, I, I always like to just uh, have a series of quotes that I pulled. Uh, I, I just made, made them anonymous and all of this is getting summarized and again, will be out there. But, you know, it's really, you know, what we're hearing. For example, I'll just take one on the historic preservation. You know, within the current study boundaries, the individual former, you know, on the board of the preservation, uh, you know, it wasn't overly concerned from what we're looking at in terms of historic preservation because so much work has already been done. However, as she had mentioned, you know, if we're changing that boundary, that might change what we're talking about in terms of issues concerning historic preservation. You know, done warehouse, and is that really a priority? Uh, I, I thought was an interesting comment. And, and, you know, this one, and not, again, you know, this this one I thought was just, I had never heard this kind of this negative impression of the antique stuff, you know, but again, it was something that, you know, came up both in the community and as well as the stakeholder, just, you know, is the retail right for everyone here? And, and I just, you know, again, wanted to just bring that up. And something else that, you know, this safety issue be, came up a few times and, and it, a little bit of this, Hudson's always been fair, you know, safe. Yeah, some things have happened recently. So I just, you know, important things. Those are what we were hearing to help us, you know, get a sense for everyone who, you know, was asking questions about what we were kind of learning. So, you know, that is, you know, everything that we have done, you know, in the last month. Um, I'll get into what's upcoming, but, you know, right now I want to get into really a work session and have, you know, the planning committee, you know, discuss and look, you know, and, and have their input on what's coming next. So the first and foremost, just to get into the public participation plan, you know, this is what we've structured. We discussed this um, at the first one. Um, we have laid it out. There are the three public events. We've done the stakeholder interviews. They are continuing. Uh, we will, uh, over the next month, those will continue. And, you know, again, and I, I may have Sheena start off this conversation about additional engagement items. But the one thing I wanted to talk about, but we could talk about that one, and the digital outreach and what other mechanisms we may want to employ uh, from, you know, online and questions. You know, we can, as we mentioned, do uh, surveys. Um, and we anticipate doing a smartphone survey in December as we start to finalize a list of the priority projects. And we want to get those um, out there so the, you know, the community can weigh in on those. It's just another way to get it in addition to the you know, December 7th public event. Um, are there other areas of online engagement or activity or a, a resource that we should look at to add to this community engagement structure? Does anyone have an opinion on that? And then, and I'll just pause right there. I don't really have an opinion on the um, online. I'm concerned about people that don't have access um, online. Can we use the local newspaper? Can you make an agreement with them that meeting notes and things like that are presented there? That, that's, uh, we, that, that's a great comment. I'm going to do one thing, just because I like to do it. Uh, who here, well, you know, actually I won't do it because there's not as much of the community as at the last one, but the reason why we talk about the smartphone technology is, you know, we find that many households do not have internet access 
you know, consistently. And so online is not, it, it, it's helpful, it's another addition, another way to reach out. Smartphones though, we find almost everybody has. And that is why we have moved away from some of the My Sidewalks, some of the other online tools that we've used in the past and have gone to, it, it's sort of the technology we've developed where we can create all of these surveys using smartphones just to you know, each city that we're working in. So that's, I think we will engage that in December. How do you get those numbers? The question was, how do you get the numbers? We don't get the numbers. Uh, what we do is we create the survey. Uh, we need to get that survey, those questions out to the community. That will be done physically through flyers, handouts, et cetera, newspapers, um, on our website, all of that. And then the community, it, it can even be at a bus station. And you just click on the, type in the Hudson DRI or Bridge District, and it immediately pops up on your phone. And it just starts asking you the questions. You just click Y for yes and for no, or if it's a number. It, it's simplistic but it captures a really large group of the community and across, you know, across the community. So that's how we'll employ it. Yes. Can you just clarify, you're, you're proposing potentially a survey that is project ranking or just general input? What I'm proposing in December would be a way for the community to begin to vet and begin to not prioritize, but you know, to identify what they think are the most important so it's, it's just helpful. It will build the community support for the DRIs. And again, you know, and, and tonight is a great example. As we talk about the preliminary, you know, we really want to understand what is most important to the community because that, you know, as we get into the final phases, is good, it's critical information to have. I have one more question. The stakeholder interviews that you've done and are doing, where does that, where does that go? So you just shared some bullet points. but. Or is there another way to learn from those conversations that you're having? What, what happens with the stakeholder interviews is all of them, eventually it'll all get summarized into just a document, you know, what we heard from all of the different uh, individuals. And it'll be more category, right? Because again, as we said in those, you know, to each of those individuals, if there's something we need to know that you don't want to have attached to your name, that's okay too. You, we we want to hear. I mean, that's essentially why we do those. Um, but again, you know, the themes and the information will be summarized, and that's again another you know document that comes out of this. And well, yeah, Matthew, I'm going to defer only because. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so my question was: at some point, we identify, let's say, seven or eight projects that we're supportive of. We submit those, and they get reviewed at the state level. Is that correct? For the DRI. Right. Right. So I, I guess what I'm wondering is: let's say some percentage of our um, projects are not acceptable to the state. They don't meet the criteria. They're not, they're not happy with what we've identified as projects. Is there some back and forth that goes on between us and the state for a month or two thereafter until we get it, until we get it right? Actually, I think that's a great question that comes up. Yes, and it's going to be more than just seven projects. I can assure you of that. There will be a number of them. And what will happen in December, we will have identified all of the projects that have come to the fore that meet the goals, are supported by what the community is looking for. Now we've got that set of projects. We're vetting those between mid-December through January. It's a, it'll be a constant back and forth because what the, you know, we need to make sure that these projects are real projects, real initiatives that can happen and be you know, brought out and leverage additional resources. And so that is what we'll be going back and forth on. In fact, we've got a, when we get into that, we'll put probably a little bit more information and Jamie will start it off about what are strong projects. It's coming in the, um, not on my agenda, there. you have it on your agenda in front of you when we start looking at the project profiles, the projects that we've identified. So uh, I wanna make sure we're gonna cover a couple of things, a couple of the questions that were asked. So did everybody get the stakeholder list that went out today? Just wanna make sure everybody received that? No, okay. So. We will make sure we get that to you so everybody has that complete list. Um, this indicates, I believe, whether or not they've had their meeting or not. Is that what this column on the far right side is? Yes, and uh, we really kind of pulled this together so you would have it this evening. Uh, that is the list that some of you have and the rest of you will get either tonight or tomorrow morning. Just essentially lists every name that has come based on what we were requesting for individuals or types of individuals to meet. This is a total list of every name that's been identified. I have tried to reach out to almost everyone on that. You know, 
list. I've heard back from quite a few, and I've set up meetings with them. The yes means we've actually met physically in person. Some have been quick conversations. I'm going to call out Sarah as an example of a conversation we had. I just started talking about, you know, not an interview, but we had a, a good conversation about, you know, what the needs are just from the last public meeting. I just want to make sure I had that in there. You know, that is just an example. But we, for the most part, have been trying to reach out and, and will continue to. Um, we're not going to get everyone, and, it, and it's hard to get all of these scheduled. I, I will say one thing. Most people that I've reached out to preferred one-on-one -on -one conversations, which is a little bit difficult when you see such a long list. And so we're trying to group them, but it was, you know, so we had a lot going. But there's, there is time. We'll set aside the time for other ones just to make sure we get them completed. Okay. So with that covered, um, I sent out the link to the website. Hopefully everybody had already seen it. And if you haven't, I would strongly encourage you to take a look at it and give us feedback. We want the website to be albeit not everybody in the community has internet access for sure, but for those that do or can go to the community library or other centers to get it, we want this to be the central repository, right? Um, jumping off of that, as I, as I mentioned in my email earlier, anybody who has a prominent website for your business or your uh, community organization, if you can link to this site to help encourage and drive um, residents to the website, as a place for information, that would be that would be huge. It would be a big help. The second piece of that, as it relates to um, the communications and the outreach. So going back to your survey idea and talking about getting people out on the street and physically inter interacting and engaging with the community to do those surveys, if that's something that we decide to do, that's another piece that those of us at the table who have a constituency in the community, we're looking to you for that help, right? You all touch a different demographic of this community, so we don't want to just tell you what we're doing, right? What Sheena and the folks at um, HPDC, I, well, I don't know, I can never get it right. Um, HCPDA, thank you. Um, and, and Mike uh, Tucker and the folks at uh, um, CEDC. CEDC, thank you. I don't know why I'm going to. <laughs> yeah, a lot of it. Um, we don't want to just tell you what they're doing, we want you to contribute to that. So please, um, you know, step forward and, and help us with that, because I think it's going to be a big part of the public participation especially in a very abbreviated time frame, right? So I want to just make sure we, we touch on that. Um, and then just in general on communication, so um, Sarah asked, you know, how, do, how is the information from the stakeholder meetings going to come out to everybody? How is any part of what we're doing going to get to all of us? Um, that is something we spent some time this morning talking about. And, you know, we're only three weeks into this. Um, we're moving at a really fast pace, and before we know it, five months is going to be behind us. But we don't want to look back with any regret. We want to make sure that we have fully communicated or over-communicated to all of you. So a couple of things that we agreed to do, um, the co-chairs, the state team um, from DOS and HCR. Just to make sure everyone can hear you. You've got a pretty good voice, but thank you. Um, we agreed this morning that we're going to have weekly calls. And anybody who wants to join us on those is welcome. Um, this is not exclusive to us, but as the co-chairs, sort of helping uh, manage this process with Steve and his team, want to make sure that we are staying constantly in touch with each other. And from that, we're going to send out weekly updates. So Steve's going to update us weekly in an email, and that's going to be disseminated back out to the, to the LPC as a whole. So each week as he meets with new people, as we approach deadlines, as we look at week past, week ahead, and stay on target for things, that's one of the things that we are committed to, to putting uh, on the table there for everybody to stay engaged. Does anybody, anybody want to add to that? Anything that I, that I missed from this morning? Committee meetings? When do they plan? So we're going to, gonna, we're, the subcommittee meetings, yeah, we're going to yeah. talk about that at, at the end um, and, and the structure, form, timing of all that, uh, as well as our calendar of meetings between now and, and the deadline for the mid-December project uh, list. So we'll get to that in a little bit. Thank you. And again, for anyone who can't see it from uh, out there, it's a very simple website. That it's HudsonDRI.org. And and again, as all of this material um, is developed, it'll be available there. It will, obviously will be available on the Department of State's uh, DRI website as well. But just another way um, to make sure that everyone's um, being able to access all of this material that's being created, the deliverables, etc. Okay. So uh, order of business. Um, this came to be, this question was raised, you know, why is the boundary along 2nd Street when it really should 
possibly be along third to match the second ward boundary limits. Um, we have discussed this. It, the, you know, the fact of the matter is, you know, if there was a project, you know, even you know, in this area, if it really meets the goals of the DRI, it, it's very close to the DRI. They're still being can be considered. I uh, just want to make sure I'm clear on that. Um, but this would, um, you know, align second ward and want to, you know, we can, we can do this. I mean, the planning committee can make this decision. Just want to get your input on this if this is absolutely we should do it. If there's any reason why, you know, we're, we're fairly okay. We created this boundary. You know, we, we're, we're not going to change it and then go to the next block, block, right? So it's a, you know, the question becomes, does it make sense to change this from your perspective? And or should we, you know, leave it as it was created? We can go either way. It's it's really it's up to you to make that decision as the planning committee. Does anyone have any insights? Questions before we make that decision on the additional blocks? Have you looked at where there would be potential project because uh, it's a much more residential and filled-in area? So <laughs> if we're adding it. Where, what are we looking at? We, you know, there are not, we have not specifically identified any additional project that might be in there. I mean, to, to be perfectly honest, you know, we haven't changed the boundary line, so, uh, but there are, again, you know, that idea of the historic structures, um, there could be potential opportunities um, within there. You know, if there comes to be a type of, you know, grant uh, program or revolving loan fund program, and these are components that we're already looking into, um, that may create a larger pool of opportunity. Um, you know, but again, you know, it, it, it would likely be related to a you know a business, so it, it may not be it may be limited, but it does potentially create more of an opportunity. It also potentially spreads the opportunity. So it's you know just again, if it if it you know from my perspective, if this makes sense and this is important, you know, we can do that and just you know and. I, my fear is that we're going to create a, well, now let's do this, and, and we, we just don't have a lot of time to be making decisions or spending our energies on issues like the you know, boundary lines. So if I can just speak to this for one quick second, and then let's have some fruitful conversation around this. Um, the boundary, so if you go back to the original um, BRI application two years ago, the application <coughs> from the city of Hudson was like all of Hudson. Right, so all the way up Warren Street to Seventh or Eighth, and it was everything in the Bridge District. It was a really, really big. I don't want to sound sorry. It's um, just to speak loud because I, I can see people are just. So the original crazy. district was really, really big, um, and the and the award didn't make it through the first round in part because it was not confined and constrained to a designated, targeted area. If you go to the the qualifications for a DRI application from both rounds, it was a compact, and I'm going to paraphrase it slightly, but it's a compact, well-defined well -defined boundary, right? So the, the folks who put together this application, um, I think, did a good job of taking feedback from the first round to the second round. The application was this defined boundary, right? Um, so yeah, it can move, but in a city like Hudson, it's a very slippery slope, right? You start to move, you go one block, and then, well, what, what about the next block? And what about the next block, right? Um, so. I'm not pre predetermining the decision, but I just want to say in answering John's question about are there projects in that area? Maybe, maybe not. Um, there's probably projects in the whole surrounding area. So I want to stress that the boundary will be whatever the boundary is. The project list can include and will likely include projects that fall outside of the boundary so long as they tie to the goals and the strategies of what this group decides and has a very viable ability to be funded and completed in the time frame, right? So, and Jamie, feel free to jump in at any point that I'm... I'm doing great, man. Okay, great. Um, so I think that's a really important thing to, to focus on in terms of thinking about where you start and stop that line is what's in it and what's out of it. Pretty much everything is in it until, until the list is complete, right? So, with that, thoughts? Well, it makes sense not to make a decision today, tonight, without going and driving around, looking at those areas for all of us, personally inspecting and seeing what goes on there. We seem to have a lot to do in one area as it is expanding it here today and expecting us to make a decision and doing that today seems a little quick for my liking. So I, I'd like to, personally, I'd like the time to take a look at the, around there and see what sort of opportunities lie. Um, but. I mean, can't we just go outside the boundary if we have a good idea for something else that's two blocks or four blocks or six blocks? Yeah. 
right? Yeah, so that's exactly. Isn't it point. kind of a moot point? It, it, to a certain extent, it is a moot point. And one of the other things that, and, and then we'll go to Brenda's uh, comment. When we had the public workshop, there wasn't a lot of commentary about the the de definition of so the boundary. That's why I'm wondering where this is driven from. Yeah. I, th I think I can answer that. Please. Um, my, in the public work session, I was in a work group with two or possibly three school teachers from the Hudson School District. And they felt that that was a, a, a socioeconomic boundary between second and third, and a large group of stakeholders that might be excluded from this process just by the definition of the boundary, so that many more people would be included by having that group. They also mentioned the fact that Hudson Promise is located there, and it serves a huge number of people in the community and is a social anchor in the community. And they felt that it would be much easier to embrace and reach the people that are served in the community through Hudson Promise if the line were extended. So I, I, I think they, one of them at least asked if that was a conscious decision to exclude that area. And I, I, I felt confident saying I didn't think there, was, there were any natural exclusions. I no. think that the boundary was driven by something else entirely, but I think it was in, in, in the interest of involving and engaging more stakeholders. Bob had a comment. <laughs> yeah, instead of uh, moving the boundaries, I look at maybe more project specific about something there, and for the 20 plus years I've been on community action groups in this town, Third Street has been the gateway to Hudson. And it's been talked about for many years, what we can do to have that first impression from people visiting this town how it should look. So I wouldn't say maybe moving the boundary, but maybe look at that Third Street uh, access point to Hudson and not move it around to include a lot of things. But that's again just because it's been set, uh, said many, many times over that Third Street and, and Warren is our you know again the first impression that many people will see when they move in here, and it, uh, it's improved over the years by leaps and bounds. There's still of course room for improvement, but. I say maybe not move the line, but let's look at certain projects that can benefit you know uh, you know more you know more bang for your buck, if you will, to see what you know where we can go from there. So um, I'd like to add when we were developing this application, can everybody hear me okay? When we were developing this <coughs> application, um, there was a, a really strong focus on the waterfront. We're about to embark on the process of revising the LWRP. The state is also very focused on waterfronts. So um, having a district that is, uh, you know, that is <laughs> along the waterfront certainly made a lot of sense. Um, there also is no shortage of opportunities in that compact area. So we were able to come up with so many projects and the list was actually narrowed down. Um, that doesn't mean that that the final projects would, uh, you know, will be included in, in that list. But um, there were so many things that could potentially be done in that in that small amount of space. And frankly, ten million dollars isn't a lot of money. So um, we're looking at getting uh, getting the most bang for our buck here, and really, you know, getting projects uh, off the ground quickly. I would only say that because we moved boundaries with the um, fair and equal campaign, I think people are sensitive to them right now and thinking a lot about them right now and trying to figure out where they fit into this newly created ward boundary situation in Hudson. Um, so I can understand the feeling, the potential feeling of exclusion when things have just so recently changed. So I think we should be sensitive to that, if not to put uh, necessarily projects there, but just the way people perceive how they're included and excluded in this town, which is a perpetual issue. Mm -hmm. Good point, Todd. I would ask you for your feedback. I mean, you've had some conversations over the past three weeks. Has this been brought up with the individuals? And the next question would be, if it has, are there programs like you've been considering potentially that would address housing, that there's more homeowners in that area versus renters? And how does it fit into some of the priorities you've been getting feedback on? I'll be honest, it, it's not, it, it hasn't come up very often, but also it, I mean, that can very simply be, it wasn't a question we were necessarily asking. You know, we were talking about our study area. Uh, and it was Carol um, who explained to me, you know, again, we were talking about that historic preservation, that a lot of the areas within the study area have already been identified, the historic structures, et cetera. And so that, that's almost, that's already done, accomplished. 
um, if we were increasing the boundary line and if there were any programmatic or you know funding elements connected to historic structures there's probably more um, and also when you kind of think more you know on the north side here and some of the changes happening that you know we might want to start thinking then historic preservation becomes a different priority level of priority and that was one perspective but it was a good perspective that I thought and so it's just but again you know it's we, they still fit right so if there's a good project there you know they still we can make a case for it but they, uh, it's really a, it's a decision um, you know do we want to how important is it for the inclusivity component and you know and others or do we just let's go forward we made a decision let's talk about good projects and focus our energies on good projects that can be completed I start the conversation I'll finish it I mean the key to all these committees and awards is know, know thy audience. Our audience is the state approving this. They're not going to know where you make a left turn in Hudson. They're not going to know where promises versus the district is. They're not going to know a lot of the sensitivities that everybody is saying here. It is our duty to do the community outreach to include everybody, but I'll, I'll be the bad guy. I, think, I don't think we should move this boundary one foot, and I think we should decide tonight. I think we should move forward as quickly as we can. I, I, don't, I don't want to confuse the people judging us. Any yes. So, just by show of hands, is there is there any consensus in, in keeping it where it is? Can we can we just start there? May I just ask one question for you? Though, which is, we're saying even if we vote to keep the boundary where it is, yep. it would not exclude a project in that area if it were appropriate and met the goals of our. From what I understand, anywhere in the city budget, right? David. The intent of the DRI program is to focus in on a, a well-defined, yeah. compact area for a downtown, so to say. Uh, in some communities, they look at their uptown, but in this case, it happens to be a downtown, it happens to be on the waterfront. If there are projects that, that can be programmatically connected to that area that was defined, and even if it happens to be a location or if it happens to be that uh, there may be something right here and you want to put a connection in either with landscape or sidewalk, something along those lines, it makes sense to connect it, okay? If it happens to be something over here where, you know, it's a real tenuous kind of connection between the two types of projects or your goals that are going to be identified through the planning process, it doesn't make sense for those. And so it's, it's kind of a fluid boundary. And so if there happens to be projects in here that you say, hey, you know what, this connects to the entire area, this connects to the goals that we want to see for the redevelopment, then yeah, you can certainly pursue a project there. And so the idea is that it will be somewhat fluid. And so it isn't necessarily something to belabor, to think too hard about. I, I recognize that lines on a map often create you know, conflict just because of the nature of things, especially when you look at re resources and whatnot. But if there can be connections, to the goals, to the strategies that you're looking to do, then certainly we can have a project that's outside of the area. And so not citywide, let's, let's kind of hone it in, let's focus in on a particular area. And this was, some attention was given to this boundary. So if it's connected to that, then we can certainly focus in on that. Does that make sense? Is this a speak now if you ever hold your peace issue? Or I mean, <laughs> no, no, right? I mean, outside like, of the boundary, right. and it's fine. No, and I wasn't so, suggesting a show of hands no, as a I'm final vote. I'm just that. trying to gauge. Gauge the, the consensus broadly, and I think tonight don't move it. I would agree. With you. Well, a fair question, and just to read in, just to say, because uh, we started for those who say don't move it tonight on the committee, just to get a sense. And as, as we go through the planning process, if something jumps out and it's identified, then certainly you can, you can revisit it and say, hey, there's a project we've identified, and so maybe there's a bubble, you know, something along those lines. So I think, I think that's fine. Okay. And we'll, we'll talk about um, vision, we'll talk about goals, we'll talk about projects throughout the rest of the, the night. And I'll just add, you know, it's five minutes to seven. I'm told we do have the building until nine. Um, so anybody who wants to stay and continue talking after eight, we can, we, I don't think we have to have a hard cutoff. Um, because I say that only because we're very, well, we've got until nine o'clock. Yeah, we've got, a, we've got a compressed timeline. I, don't th I, I think we want to make sure we give it the right, you know, time. So. I am moving on. The you know the initial vision statement and on your agendas, if you haven't flipped your agendas over, you have the what I'm about to put on from this. But you know this was you know the, the vision statement that I read at the first meeting three weeks ago that we gave to the the commit the public, and again you saw their input on it. From all of that, 
you know, we have created this revised vision statement, which I will read out loud because I, I know not everyone in, in this room can read this. Um, increase develop, you know, I'm going to do just so that we can he hear the comparison for those who are, may not have been at the last one. This is the original vision statement as included in the application. Increased development of mixed use projects that incorporate affordable and market rate housing and transportation oriented design. Workforce development and reimagining the waterfront for expanded public use and enjoyment. While tourism is a seasonal surge economy for the Hudson, the DRI application proposes to create an environment for high quality year round living wage jobs. And here is the revised with input from the, the community and the community workshop. Increased development of sustainable mixed use projects that incorporate affordable and market rate housing and transportation oriented design, workforce development, access to healthy, affordable food, and reimagining the waterfront for expanded public use and enjoyment. Preserve and enhance diversity in the district by prioritizing current residents. While tourism is an engine for the Hudson economy, leverage the DRI to create an environment for high quality year round living wage jobs for local residents. So again, you know, this is not final, but I'd like to make sure it's final, you know, as we come out of this meeting. <laughs> so this is a, this is the opportunity for the, you know, for us to really talk about this. Again, it you know, it's more of this idea, you know, comments were, you know, tourism is increasingly not seasonal, right? So don't just call that out. You know, but it's about creating this place and making sure it's a place for everybody. And that and, and again, the focus on jobs and affordability across the spectrum, housing, food, shopping, et cetera. Yes. Um, could you give some context around um, the, the implications of the language and the vision statement? So it would help determine what's worth picking apart if, if the vision statement was going to have serious implications for how we're looking at projects. What weight does this carry? Well, it's a that's my question. Yeah, we're not going to read, read this every day and go, Is it worth it know, to make it or what? And we <laughs> All right. So let's take one step back. It, that's a very good question. But again, and, and as per the... This seems like it's developed, so go for it. What's good? And then I think we should move on to all the work that we have to do. Looks great. I don't know what everybody else thinks, but... Hits all the corners for me. We have lots of boxes. We may actually make go through something very quickly. Good for here. tonight. Good for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yes, can you answer yes. the question of what weight does it carry? The weight that the weight that a vision statement carries is I mean just the vision statements at the top, right? This is the the overarching vision for this. So every DRI initiative has to fall within this vision, right? It's not going to be about you know something that is a sports element. A something else that doesn't fit within this. The goals are going to be the next step down and the goals are going to create categories by which projects are going to be organized. And then within those goals, we need to identify specific strategies that again, are going to essentially identify and align project profiles. So. I just want to make one suggestion. After mixed use in the first sentence, we put commercial projects <laughs> We're clear that it can incorporate affordable housing, market rate housing, but key word to me as reading this, we don't focus enough on commercial. Mixed use to include commercial, and, and by the way, Phil's taking notes on all this right there, so that is absolutely, and in fact, that, that's, a, that's a good comment because, you know, having affordable, you know, commercial office spaces was something that we heard a bit, quite a bit about, so good. Well, to, to echo that, this is an economic development grant. Right. I think that's great. Good. Is there any other touchstone that anybody feels is left out of this vision statement, which is just simply a guide for the rest of what follows? Any other? Yes, there. Well, I just, I'll say it quickly, but just that la the, the language that was tweaked around tourism being the engine as opposed to just seasonal, um, I do think I would just want to make sure that implied in the statement is thinking about economic development beyond tourism. It's, not tourism only. So, nope. so and so. Well, I think that's what it's saying. So, it's, while while that's important, we're leveraging the DR, DRI for the create. purposes of yes. economic development writ large, not not yes. just. How about instead of engine is important for? So it doesn't sound like the engine. Yeah, that was my concern. Is that the engine maybe made? But I, was, I do think that is what the sentence is meant to do. But while tourism is an important <laughs> is, is important for the Hudson economy. Okay. 
It's not the end all be all, it's important. Okay, done. I, and again, you know, this will be <laughs> completed and sent out to the, the planning committee uh, probably tomorrow. <laughs> so, okay. Now, uh, again, I, I sort of essentially described it, you know, we've got, we'll have the vision completed. The goals is what we're doing right now, and that's, you know, we're going to start these and hopefully get, make real progress on them tonight. The goals are the next buckets that are really beginning to, the, you know, identify the conceptual ideas that the plan needs to address, you know, and then the projects are organized by these goals. Uh, you know, we don't want to have a lot of goals. We want to have, you know, four. Five. I think in Oswego we may have only had three, possibly four. There's a number of strategies that come under these, but you know, again, we want these to be more obviously below the vision, but you know, fairly concise in terms of how many we have. I am going to just emphasize something right here on this draft goal ideas, just to get us talking, because these draft goals are a culmination of you know what were the top priorities from the community. Um, what we've been hearing from the stakeholders and what, of course, we heard from the planning committee um, from the first meeting. And so these are, you know, I essentially wrote these, but I, and I, I just want to say that in the sense that these should not be what the final ones are. It's a, it's a way to start to think about. And I'll tell you what, from my perspective, you know, the waterfront uh, collectively really was a priority from almost everyone we spoke to and from what we heard, uh, as was, again, affordable housing, and what, you know, in terms of using this mixed income residential, but again, this mixed income commercial and residential, I think is something that we could immediately think about changing, is this idea of, you know, across the entire DRI, when you're talking about development or, or housing, it should be, you know, for everyone. And so mixed income residential development, increase access to high quality, affordable, and when possible, local food. The local food push is strong, but that doesn't solve everybody's food issues. And so, again, I, I, I just put it in this way. Um, lower case, I got the commercial, create lower cost spaces for entrepreneurs, creative work, workforce. You know, that again speaks to, you know, what's happening at the warehouse and, you know, with the CAS, you know, redevelopment, some real opportunities for creating affordable live workspaces, other sort of, you know, creative work, you know, work shared workspaces. And then eventually, you know, the last, and I certainly not least, help train for and help create jobs. And I lumped workforce training and economic development into that one together. And, you know, this is what I want to really talk about tonight. You know, see what we think about this. And are there, you know, should there be another key goal that I, I missed here? But this is, this is an important conversation. So we better hear from you on this. What is the process for drafting goals? This conversation right here, right now. Thank you. Good hands. So we're going to start this conversation. We're going to have, you know, we're going to, we're going to sort of pick apart that vision statement and build the goals around the elements of that vision statement, right? So um, one thing I want to just put on the table as, as an overarching goal is the goals are going to lead to the projects, right? The, str the strategy and the projects. Um, so as you think about the goals, think about projects that will be, as I said before, fundable and achievable within the time frame that we have. What is it, two years? Is that the, what, what's the post-application? There isn't a limit. It's there as is. quickly as possible. More okay. post so, so think of it in two years or less, because I think that's an achievable uh, time frame. Some will be quicker, some will be maybe longer. But, um, so think about that if we think about the goals, because we don't want to get to a place where the goals are so lofty that the projects that would fit within those goals are unachievable and we're sending something to the state, to John's point, right, to have them like judge us later and say, what were you thinking, right? So I put that out there. Yeah, and I'll even just add to that, you know, these goals, because they're shaped by the planning committee, it, you own them too, right? So you bring them out to the community, like, we, we, we created these. Um, and, and maybe we can just start, you know, for the first, connect to and improve the waterfront. You know, an area of a project that, you know, I think we need to, strengthen and is really improve how you connect to your waterfront. That, from our perspective on everything we've heard and seen, is something that increasingly is important. Uh, so it's, you know, that it was the connect to, that means, you know, infrastructure improvements, um, pedestrian, bikeable, all of that connected to trail works. Connecting your waterfront to the city and beyond uh, is important from our standpoint. 
issue there is number one you say connect to the waterfront that's infrastructure that means we're spending almost a dollar for a dollar versus two three and four where you're probably spending 20 percent to an 80 percent contribution from a private source so we have 10 million dollars not 100 million dollars so you got to decide how much of number one you want to spend a dollar for a dollar for because there's nobody going to say hey i'd like to privately own your sidewalk unless you're going to give them a toll road so that's a dollar for a dollar. How much of our $10 million are we willing to say the infrastructure or the entryway is worth to us versus how much are we spending on, a, on, a, on an 80-20 split? So if you want to leverage this $10 million into $50 million or $80 million or $100 million. So I think if we decide that first, then you'll know how much money you, you have for one. And to a lesser extent, number five, which again is, is a, uh, you're, you're paying people to help train. You're not getting somebody to, to volunteer there. So if I'm hearing you right, John, are you suggesting that maybe our first goal should be leverage and, and sort of some sort of structure around yes. what side how much leverage you want to your five categories and then you'll have your $10 million split up. Shouldn't we pick our projects or identify a dozen projects or agree on 10 projects or five projects first? So but, isn't but, that, yeah. but projects don't matter unless you know what bucket you're putting a project in. An infrastructure bucket, like a sidewalk to connect to the waterfront or a bridgeway or a walkway, is a dollar bucket. This is, this is a great conversation. I just want to interject on one piece because you, you are right on the one hand. So number one may not uh, attract private dollars. Other public dollars are so we a leverage. That leverage. So just don't forget that. And then, yeah. you know, and then think about the metrics too. You know, how you leverage private or other dollars is a huge metric as we've stated. You know, quality of life improvements is not something to ignore. No. So, so tell us what leverage we can get for that bucket of number one. Yeah. Well, it's like you know, is it is there transportation it funding? Depends on the project. It's right. going so to depend it on the is project. It's a little bit of a catch twenty two. It is to, to Colin's point. So um, I have a clear definition of the, 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 the buckets, and the, and I think we need a very clear, plain spoken leverage conversation. So mm -hmm. everybody understands what we're talking about when we're speaking about leverage in terms of are we talking about outside funding, other funding other than this ten million dollar challenge that we're referring to? Well every in in the original application and all these goals and, and state projects they expect somebody who's say doing a uh, warehouse project that's gonna create jobs. How much are they bringing to the table? They're saying I will build a warehouse for ten million dollars. If you give me two million dollars I can use it as my equity, I can get financing, I can get my seed capital, I can get investors. So in our project, we have a $10 million allotment. We're telling the state, we're going to fund this warehouse redevelopment for $2 million of our $10 million. The leverage there is 20%, so you got a $10 million kick to the economy that you spent $2 million on. On an infrastructure gateway project, uh, there may be DOT or other Department of State um, funding, um, but the say, and they're very expensive, and they're usually prevailing wage, and they're usually um, higher cost jobs. So there you might have, okay, we got some state funding for a sidewalk project or a gateway project. It cost $5 million and we got $2 million of it funded by the state. So we spent $3 million of our $10 million there. So what did we get out? What boost did we get out? We got a $5 million boost using 30% of our money versus a $10 million boost using 20%. So you're going to mix it. So they, I think they told us at our last meeting, our goal is somewhere to get 60 to $80 million in leverage out of our $10 million. Well, so you have to decide that. Yeah, so I'm not sure that we want to put a, quantify it with a number. I think the simple answer is that no single DRI project is meant to be fully funded by the DRI dollars in and of itself. Okay, so that's, that's number one. So leverage is anything that goes against the total development cost of any one project. That leverage can be your dollars, it can be my dollars, it can be HCR dollars, it can, be, it can be federal money, it can be a challenge grant from some local organization um, that has some, um, <laughs> some money that they want to throw into it. It can be any, any dollars or anything that, that offsets that cost for, for fully so when funding. When we're picking our projects, we want to think about those projects and what other dollars they can yes. attract, correct? Mm -hmm. right. Correct. That's, that's, that goes to the point of a uh, project has to be funded, right? right? Yeah. Todd, Todd wants to. Isn't there already some leveraging happening into that connectivity on the waterfront now? Isn't that bridge already a project that's been? So it is. So I think it's already three or four million dollars. Some it some is some two point two million dollars. Two point two. Small piece. So we don't have to address the bridge. Right, that's and a that's a good example. That's so, one piece that that's a connectivity. So maybe we had some of that information, then that would help us 
in deciding which projects we should support because we've already identified the funding source. Uh, I'm gonna, yes, go ahead. Isn't it also true that in this process we're gonna come up with some projects that are on our priority list and we're gonna find funding for them from outside the DRI, from other state funding programs? Yes. So we don't have to just limit what we're thinking about right now? No, I mean, right now, and the question was, isn't that part of this process and in the answer of, of identifying other funds in that occurring in November, December? Yes. The, um, so, but it's not, this is, it's fair to have this conversation right now, and I, and I will go back to um, the goals that we created. Uh, what I just have up here, just again, the, uh, to John, to your, your question, you know, public improvement were 44% of, you know, the DRI round one priority project, um, and they leveraged other funding, um, for the most part, other public funding sources or organizations. A not for profit private development came in at a strong second and so it is a you know it's a it's nothing should be off the table but the idea of what does that project leverage and can it get done is the two main things that we should you know be talking about well, you and our department of state guy are our guardrails and you just keep us yeah. in in the lanes here and make sure we don't veer off yeah, we will i would just I uh, think it would be helpful to everyone on the committee if we knew what projects are already on the table. Um, and Jeff brought it up the, the bridge. Um, if we knew what all of those were, I know the Land Conservancy is doing projects. I, if, so that we know how to link them up and take advantage of things that are already happening. But in the absence of that information. Yeah, so that's here. But I, I want to, I mean, at the risk of co-opting Steve's uh, nope. purpose here. Um, I think before we get into the project, so we really have to understand what are the goals of this application. The goal is to leverage as much dollars as possible. The goal is to redevelop the waterfront. The goal is to enhance transportation opportunities for people at all income brackets. The goal is to produce uh, high quality, affordable food options for people, right? Those are the goals. I, I'm, I'm just rattling them off the top of my head. No. Bill, get transportation on there, because, right. uh, and connectivity in a broader sense. Right, I'm just rattling those off, I'm not speaking for what the goals are. I think we have to have that conversation first, and then once we have that, then we have our categories, and then we say, okay, so what are the projects that have already been identified that fit transportation, that fit food hub, that fit each of these things? Then we can talk about the merits of those, and then intersperse the other project ideas that have come to bear. In this, in, either from us as, as the LPC or from the community stakeholder meetings, and that will happen again in December as well. So that's how I, I think about this, and Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's, so oh. projects come next. But I think it would be helpful as soon as that can be compiled, that information can be made available. Well, There's no timeline about that. Well, I'm, I'm going to let Sheena interject for now. I'm just going to throw this out for you. So we did that in the DRI application because we wanted to show that Hudson is already leveraging funding so that way it can continue this. Is it all in there? Yeah. yeah. So yes. it's like a good table of current public funding. That's basically over the last five years, what we've been able to win as grants, what's been donated, those types of things. So it's in a very basic All of our projects. Yeah. <laughs> our yeah. So you know that was the proposal put out. We basically say we capitalizing off of the current public private investment, this is what we would do with continue. So it's in the application, so it's available for you to kind of And we are going to talk it. about that tonight. That is part of the agenda is to go yeah. through what those projects are. So we're going to get there. I just want to make sure we focus on Yep. And, and again, and just as a, from a time, we've got about a half hour really to talk, continue talking as a group. The community will then have an opportunity to speak. And then if we need to keep this going, to Matthew's point, uh, we will. But, I, I, you know, after the fact. So. Um, I have one, um, so one thing about goals and then one just clarifying question about leverage. My question about, my comment about the goals process is that it just, it does seem like our list of goals will potentially have some impact on what projects we end up choosing. And I think part yes. of what feels hard about this process is just is the obvious challenge of just how rushed the whole thing is and feeling like as a committee, we, we are accountable to our communities and to our public. And so just wondering if there's any, like if this is also, if there's a chance for in subcommittees to continue to draft Yes. the goals and share them with each other or if this is the this is j tonight is just a starting point getting ideas on paper okay. we're, we're likely we're going to talk about this at the end but likely going to have not only subcommittee meetings um, but also another meeting of this group before the next public engagement group so that we 
are putting something out that we all stand behind to that next public engagement group, uh, the public workshop. Okay, so in that case, my last, just two quick points. One is, um, I think, to put on there, I think this, a sentence that got added to the um, vision statement around preserving and enhancing diversity by prioritizing current residents. I don't have an idea for how you transform that into a goal that then creates a project, but I think that's a question. I think that's good. Um, and then I, can I ask one clarifying question about leverage? Or should that well, be later? Uh, no, okay, because so this, I'm glad it came up even if it was off agenda, because it does seem like um, an important concept to the DRI grant is leverage. And I'm just curious, the scenario, like let's say that, that a project that was clearly coming from all of the public engagement, like there were some really important priorities. And we as a committee were trying to work on identifying a project that was really speaking to something that seemed really priority to the community. And it was a project that um, had l didn't have as much out other funding as some of the other proposed projects. That that's all, that's all figured out already. That's all in place. There's clear funds there. Um, I'm curious about the process. It was something that Peter was kind of asking before about when our, the projects that the committee decides on then goes to the state. Is there a sort of like viability test in terms of how much, uh, like, is there a quantity around no. leverage that is required? No, it's, there is not. And that we discussed that like before, but I'll say it again too. So they can have zero leverage and still be presented. Uh, that's, the, that's the one test that will fail. So we cannot fully fund a project. I think that's what you're asking. Yeah, but, yeah. But could, a, could a project that, die even if everybody on this committee is, thinks it's really important because it has. But if it had a really high or really low leverage, <coughs> it was critical um, to every to the members of the planning committee, and it was one of the main priorities of the community. I would argue that's an important you go back to slide, bridge. You see. Yeah, go that, back that, slide. and that comes up. That is what we're doing. But that also, again, and it's just this is what's difficult, and it is fast for every project. And John made the point: to every project that might have less leverage, you're spending more of your ten million dollars. So it, you just, that's the balance that we need to together come to. So just a, a couple of comments. Um, for, for me, when I see these goals, this is kind of my, my why. And, I, and as somebody who sets goals pretty frequently, this is the why. So it's important that we answer the why before we get to the how and the what. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just my, Good that's point. always my, my process. This is really our, our purpose. This relates to the vision because this is why we're doing what we're doing. So we're sitting here. Mm -hmm. um, speaking to the, to the fifth one, could you just maybe give me an example? I get the last part about helping to create jobs. I'm struggling with how this, the, the training piece. Are you suggesting that Somehow, what may come out of this is that there's going to be a training facility or something. That, that and, and is the local community college hooked to that? Is the local BOCES hooked to that? Or the school district part of that? So, perfect example. Uh, you know, in the one of the stakeholder meetings with Ken Siblin of Digifab, you know, they're doing some work in terms of you know through workforce training with the community college. Uh, I, I, I'm going to be careful which one I speak to. But again, it's a program that they need more trained employees, and there's already a program coming together. Um, there may be a way through this, this is just an example of how can you leverage what's already happening to you know, have that part of or a physical location here in the Bridge District that you know, is an opportunity for training. And it's, you know, funding from the DRI is a part of it, but it's leveraging some already ongoing initiatives. That's a good example of creating a strong workforce development program with jobs that are actually here in, and decent paying jobs. That's a good example. And again, and that is, a, you know, this, the DRI is not all about one thing. It's not all about just building. It's not all about parks. It's about everything that creates a more vital, revitalized area, vibrant area. So, so didn't so I understand training is not uh, paying salaries, but a training program that Jamie, clarify. Can we skip two slides ahead? Yep. So this, no, one slide, go back. Sorry. This may help just to, to frame up your thinking. I know uh, sometimes goals can be kind of amorphous, and you know, how, how can we wrap our head around it? And sometimes you think in projects, it all depends how you approach the problem, right? And so this helps to put some parameters as to what, what everybody's approaching. This is what's eligible under the DRI program. It's pretty, pretty all-encompassing, but where we get into where we get into some of the things that aren't eligible are those actual training programs. 
You can do facilities, absolutely. Okay. You can do a, a training facility. facility or something along those lines. Sorry, Phil. Um, but when you get into actual funding a program, that we can't go to. And so these are more capital projects. We're looking at public improvements. We're looking at private improvements, mixed use development, mixed use with housing thrown in there. But as we said earlier, Matthew said, this isn't going to be an all funding, right? So we're looking for leveraging. We have no goals as to exactly what needs to be leveraged. There's no, okay, you're not meeting this quota, so to say. We're looking for you to maximize your funding, right? You're getting $9.7 million to invest in your community. How do you make the most out of that, that investment? And so that's going to be up for you to discuss, and that's going to go into the individual projects. So it's not that the state's going to be the one that's going to say, sorry, this meet, doesn't meet our threshold. It's going to be for you to determine what kind of cost-benefit analysis does this shake out. Is, it, is the benefit of this particular project really outweigh its, its cost? And that's going to be the consultant team as we go through the process. They're going to start to evaluate these with your help. Okay, it's not going to be as a negotiation between the state and the local planning committee. It's going to be something that's going to go in. By mid-December, you're going to have a, a, a slate of projects, so to say. You're going to start to flesh those out. How do these compare to each other? How do these not rank, but how, how is the cost benefit of one relate to another? How does the leverage look? How do the improvements in a community look? Does this achieve our goal or doesn't it? These all start to shake out as to where the, where the importance to this, commi this committee, as well as to the community as a whole, how do they all shake out? And so these are basically the parameters that the state gives to what the actual projects are. Can't look at planning activities, so no additional plans, uh, transportation plans, uh, parking plans, things like that. It's not going to be perpetual planning. Uh, staff costs, training expenses, that's what's ineligible. Everything else is pretty much up for discussion and consideration. And so certainly the sky seems to be a limit. There was, as uh, has been discussed, as Sheena provided, there was a list of projects that started the conversation that was part of that application. And then it's going to be also discussions happen here, what achieves the goal, and then where you go from there as a, to identify additional projects in addition to the $9.7 million. Maybe $15 million worth of projects, I've said it before, that will go into the plan that will be used for the DRI funding, but then other funding sources, whether it be federal, state, private investment, whatever the case may be. So if that helps our form up your thinking so we can take a step back and look at some of the goals, you know, it, it's, it's a lot to kind of weigh out to, uh, to frame your thinking as you get into the process, but hopefully this will help to focus your, uh, your, your view on it. And Jamie, just to tie, before you sit down, uh, to tie you into, so when we talk about help train for and help create jobs, maybe that's not the best way to state that. I mean, the help training does, you know, through a facility, a space within a new development, I mean, that's a physical piece that could leverage a community or a, a college program that's already in existence. Mm -hmm. um, would, would you, try to maybe rethink, I mean, that, you know. Absolutely. Say. So if you think about a location, maybe maybe there's an already a program that's out there that's looking for a home. Maybe you're looking for a facility that could say, this could be a commercial kitchen or something along those lines where people could come in and they could focus in on, uh, on a training program that would be in a facility that would be funding through DRI. You're, we're not funding the training program per se, but we're funding the facility that's there and the capital investments that go with it. So if that helps to get to change your goals, you can absolutely have your goals, but then how do you approach those goals? Yeah, so regarding the training facility, what if the training facility is a mile up the road and it's not in the DRI? Since we've talked so much about borders, we've got a community college, we've got Questar, we've got the BARD program, we've got the, the school district, we're all outside the zone. So how does that work? Because we may have space in our facility right now, say, to create some type of a training facility. Sure. So the way we approach this in the city of Middletown, just to give an example, in the city of Middletown, we had a downtown business district, and then there was Turo College, there was Orange County Community College over there. They had programs. It was connecting to those programs. And so whether it be through a transportation program, uh, fun improvements for transportation that got them from the downtown to there, so whether it be residents needed to get out to that location, so there was uh, there were improvements made to transportation networks that helped to get there. Whether it be uh, sidewalks to get there, um, something what not improvements in the facilities at those locations, but ways to get from the downtown, from the people that were in that boundary out to those particular training locations. So if I can throw in another thought, right? So if we say we're going to fund uh, Digifab, right? Digifab needs high-skilled trained workforce. 
well, you can train them, and maybe that's the tie, right? That's the connection. Right. It's the training, the training space there, that it's physically separate, but it's supporting the goals and objectives in the project that's being funded in the DRI, right? So another example to make it a little more relative. And, and I would Michelle, advocate for uh, that. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Michelle's had her hand up, so she can. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to the question of um, leveraging. Wait, can I ask a question? What would be the project, Matt, in that case, if they're training on What are you going to be funding? I'm sorry. Well, I don't know. I just, I'm trying to. You said something that I think would left more confusion than love. Guys, did you think that we could fund? If we say we're going to give them 20 percent of their project, we're going to say you have to build a workstation that's dedicated to interns. We just funded at the county level, Columbia Green, 10 million dollars capital infrastructure at Columbia Green College, part of which is creating a carpentry um, major program, like a, like a, almost like a BOCES learning carpentry. We would say to Digifab, okay, we're linking you to our new funded carpentry program because we're trying to get people who come out of these schools to work locally, stay locally, train local people have people who are going to school locally work locally. So we're, we're basically requiring as part of our funding Digifab to provide a workspace that we know will, will be attractive to the college program we just funded at the county level. That would work for that goal. How's that, Mike? I don't want to get hung up on that specific example. I was trying to find a way to I correlate. I want to caution, like in Clint's Falls, there was 39 fundable project that ideas, eight projects got funded in the end. So if you start funding things outside your DRI zone, and there's like 27 projects in the DRI zone that are worthwhile projects, you have a whole bunch of ideas outside, it's going to be hard to get those ones outside funded. I'm, I'm just giving you my ESD yeah. perspective, and we're, you know, we're looking at six of those eight projects. So, yeah. well, I, I, I want Michelle really yeah, just Michelle to speak right now. Yeah, so. Well, I just um, wanted to go back to the question of leveraging uh, matching funds and what Christine was saying earlier about um, us as a committee um, helping to identify. So, is that part of our role to help projects that we think are worthwhile that may not have already? identified additional sources of funding, can we help them to do that? That's actually on the agenda, okay. and you know, I'm, I'm very conscious of the, the clock. Uh, yes, you know, we're, we're going to get into the profiles. I, I do want to make sure that this is vetted. And again, we don't, we're not ending tonight, but I want to spend time. The projects and, you know, can still be identified, and they can be brought forward. And we are going to, Jamie actually has, you know, we're going to help with a, you know, just a, a, a template for that to, to come forward. Um, this is still ongoing. If there, the time will come when they, that will not, it'll be too late. But so, yeah, so to, to you, Michelle, and to others here, and, and again, as we said at the community event, you know, where projects can still be identified. And you should, and Matt, Matthew, I, you, do they come to the planning committee and they come to the chairs, the two chairs. And that's who they should be directed towards. So again, if you if, if anything is coming forward, get, it comes to the planning committee and to the two chairs and, and it gets vetted, it'll come into this. So yes, is the answer to you, Michelle. So I, I just want to see if I can simplify this. What's going to happen is a certain number of priori priorities are going to bubble up based on the goals that we established tonight. And then we're going to look at those priorities at, at a second level of review that says, okay, we're going to look at our $10 million and with projects four, five, and six, we can leverage $30 million. And projects four, six, and nine, you might be able to leverage $50 million. So there's going to be levels of analysis before we make a final selection. Yes. And nothing is etched in stone along the way. It's going to evolve as we know more about each of these projects. They'll all evolve. And again, what they'll just, we've got to keep thinking amongst all of us is you know projects that fit the goals fit the vision can happen uh, are the ones that are going to, to to come out and get funded and that is that is absolutely yeah they can make the time right so again um I, does this generally i'm not ending it tonight do these your transportation connectivity and transportation mobility i think is a goal that needs to be at this level that I didn't have here. That is something I definitely heard tonight. And is there any other a diversity in, in that you know, diversity in the people who are here? Another and commercial and redevelopment. Commercial development and redevelopment. And, and within that, you know, 
creating these commercial spaces is something that I definitely I think we can take a stab at. And again, you know, this is an ending, but we've gotten some information here to shape them. Uh, we should continue to get input from the, the committee as, as we work on these. I feel strongly instead of prioritize mixed income residential, I think it needs to be mixed use. Mixed, mixed income, income, mixed use. Yeah, I just think for a livable city of what you're Thank talking you. about, that's Good really point. important. Mixed income, mixed use. Perfect. That's that's great. And that also talks about the commercial everything that we just mentioned. So, yes, uh, and then and then to Michael. Uh, I'd like to see the connect and to and improve the waterfront, uh, add to that, and the river itself. So river waterfront and the river itself. That's a great. That's that's great. That's the pier. That's all of it. That's great. And the then, waterfront and river. Uh, So the uh, that's a, a complete streets uh, streetscape improvements should be at this high of a level. Uh, I think that's the public realm. That there's probably a goal that we can turn that into. That would be a little bit that would encompass you know the complete streets and some of those improvements. See now we're actually getting to these. This is good. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, oh, Michael. He, he, so, yeah, I just had a clarifying question. So, on the on the job or workforce training piece, so so the actual training is not DRI fundable, but but if it's leveraged privately, can that aspect of it be DRI fundable? In other words, can the can the leveraged P if we're if we're proposing yes. the, yeah, the, the so project like the facility, like let's say there was a, a vacant building on Warren Street. Right um, and Second Street, that could be used as a workforce training facility. We could use the funds to finance the development of the facility. You could come in from Bard, and Tinny could come in from the high school, and you guys could be human. the leverage because you're the human capital that's coming in and, and creating the uh, putting the program in that building. Right? That's that's a different way of saying what I was trying to say before. Right? Is pairing those two things together. Right? Um, can I make a suggestion here? So we've got we're you know at 7:30, um, so cognizant of the time. We've got a couple of goals up here. Um, if we could maybe start with um, what we have and just reinforce each of these a little bit um, as, as Christine was just doing. So on the waterfront, so leverage, uh, accessibility to the river, um, streetscape, the mayor mentioned to me, uh, green space, right? Thinking about, and, and yeah, you know, thinking of Christine here um, in the CLC, like tying in that green space. What other priorities does the group have around the waterfront that we want to list on, on this? Well, you're really talking about increasing usage of the waterfront, and you have right. to rationalize how these uses interact. I mean, you got, you're got you going to have more pedestrians, you're going to have okay. more vehicles, you're going to have more commercial traffic. There's commercial traffic there already. Mm -hmm. How do you provide for a rational uh, use of all these different uh, transportation modes. And that's getting right into the strategies that are going to fall under this. That's great. You know, you know, increase the usage of our waterfront, which means... Right. Are we stopping and talking about that right now? Right? About that? About yeah, about the waterfront. Yeah, that's what I thought we'd do. Let's focus on a, yeah. a topical area. So let's not move, move away from that. Right? So let's, <laughs> right. let's stay there. Let's stay there. Go ahead, Mayor. So to add um, uh, some thoughts to Tony's point, the there is going to be a focus on increased um, uh, transportation to the waterfront. And um, one of my concerns is we're looking at, um, at sidewalks, we're looking at roads, we're looking at making a safer crossing over the Broad Street crossing. Um, and that would leverage DOT dollars. And as many of you know, that's something that DOT dollars are not, um, they're not always easily accessible, and they're often uh, very far out, right? So we have the bridge, for instance, we found out last year we had the money, but we can't build the bridge until 2020. So um, I just don't, I, I'm not, it, it's something that I think is really critical. Um, I just wonder how that works in terms of the timing for D, you know, viable DRI projects. So the bridge itself as a, as a project? Well, right, but also just, um, you know, being able, 
aside from the bridge, being able to access the waterfront across the Broad Street um, at grade crossing. Mm -hmm. So there would, I would think that we would perhaps look at reworking all of that, add some sidewalks. You've got people and trucks and trains and bikes and everything sort of coming together right there. It's a mess down there. It is. It's a huge mess. Mm -hmm. So um, I will tell you, we're actually, uh, just, it's a great challenge for everyone to start to think about you know, in that particular location, are there other more immediate funds that, because again, in some cases, uh, even small amounts, it's still a leverage that can create a real immediate improvement to a core part of the bridge district. So that is, and we're looking at it too, we've got transportation uh, individuals, they are looking specifically at that area. So that's a good point. Well, let me ask, where does the Dunn Warehouse fit into that scape? Because isn't that a project that was going to be improved and then perhaps leased out to, yep. to potential um, occupants, which would then that you know, leverage right those dollars and provide materials. revenue? So if I can, without getting into the specifics of what Dunn Warehouse might become, can we just say that the utilization and revitalization of the Dunn Warehouse should be a key component of the waterfront yeah. goal? Yeah. Is that is that a fair broad statement? Perfect. Perfect. That's okay. Exactly. That's a driving the home. That's exactly. Um, okay. So as it relates to waterfront, we think about leverage. We think about and, and all the different forms of, of leverage for all the, the projects. Um, we think about accessibility and usage of the waterfront. We think about pedestrian safety and utilization of the infrastructure and revitalization of the infrastructure as necessary to support an increased. Um, utilization of the waterfront, right? We've got the Dunn Warehouse. Um, what about services required for people who use the waterfront, like washrooms and uh, food, food? We've got a brand new uh, $200,000. It's got a new one. <laughs> but isn't it locked? It's open. Right. So, yeah. So, um, you know, within the vision statement, it's waterfront sure for nice expanded there. use and enjoyment. That's sort of the, the broad statement, and the goals the goals will support that. Is there anything that should, that we haven't covered relative to the waterfront that anybody wants to? Whether or not we want, and I, I think that we would be remiss in not including it, but the North Bay in this as well. So we have the Fergari, we've got this city-owned space, and um, you know what we'd like to see happen. <coughs> and that is as part of the, uh, the waterfront, much like, yeah. Yeah. Right. The Usually when people talk about the waterfront, everybody right. thinks about yep. riverfront. Right. So let's make sure that's included, absolutely. Okay. So, Can, yeah, go ahead. I mean, we use the term TOD for the CAS project. I think it's an overlapping term that really needs to be looking at the waterfront district in general. And we keep kind of touching on points of transit-oriented design, but can't we just kind of move that up to this, that it's not only for the CAS redevelopment? I, I think you, sure. I, I think the CAS redevelopment, I've often thought, you know, it's not just a transit-oriented, I mean, it is a transit-oriented development, but it also is probably a critical anchor within this area to help develop the public realm that's going to come around. So, you're, yeah, your whole this area, yes, it's a TOD, and then it's more. It's revitalizing this area. So, what if we um, if we shift gears now? If there, does anybody have anything else for the waterfront that we didn't cover that they want to put in in a goal statement, not a project, but a goal statement about the waterfront? Traffic patterns, both commercial and uh, you know, lightweight car uses. Yeah, so I think that fits in the sort of pedestrian utilization and infrastructure piece of it. So, to Todd's point, I think it's a good segue to talk about transportation connectivity, and I think as it relates to, I'm gonna throw this on the table for, for food for thought. As it relates to transportation and connectivity as a goal, um, our, I think our goal should be ensuring that TOD is an element of all of the projects that are are brought forward under all of the categories, right? So that, that to me isn't mutually exclusive of any part of this, it's sort of an overlay over all of it, right? So if our goal is to ensure that there is greater transportation efficiency and development. That should be that should be an element of every project. And safety as and, well, right? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Pedestrian safety, transit oriented development. Is that is that hit on what you're talking about at all? Or my way off base? 
Yeah, I'm cool with it. I appreciate that it's a universal design element. Does everybody agree with that as a sort of general statement? Yeah. I just think it recognizes that it has reciprocity, right? I mean, it's making sure that you have some empowerment and that you have some hierarchy that is respected across the different modes. I think, modes. I think it, it, absolutely. I think TOD attached to any one site here doesn't make sense. It's all of these are, you know, components of transit-oriented development compact, walkable, more urban environment around key transportation nodes. So what else on transportation and connectivity? Anybody have, I mean, is this where we add, you know, focus on wayfinding and, um, and I don't know, Jeff, you, you're shaking your head, you want to speak to that? No, I'm saying, I think that's where you, wayfinding is an important uh, piece to that. Yeah. And potentially a bus. A bus? Is, yeah. Not a bus. No, not a bus. Okay. Um, just want to be sure. We talked about a small um, electric bus. Not a self-driving one like they had in LA. Crash. Right. Um, Those are coming, by the way. And, and <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Um, right. The long range is a good part of this. So, so expand on that a little bit. The, the, the transportation with a bus to connect different ends of town, to connect mm -hmm. the waterfront to Warren Street, to connect. What? And What's connect, the, connect the waterfront to, um, you know, as Tinny was talking about, having other locations where we might be able to tap into training opportunities. But right now, people don't necessarily have a way to get there. And mm -hmm. I know that um, the county has just uh, started running um, a bus again to the college, but, um, but we don't have an easy way to get to the schools or to other locations outside of the district. But, oh, yes. Will we be then? Funding a company that was going to invest in more transportation, or will we be buying buses? <laughs> well, that's the project piece of it. Right. So let's take a step back from that. That's a great question, but I think we should let's maybe table that, right? Um, just to stay focused on goals. And we definitely have have data based on past right. experience. So, is, oh, go ahead. Well, is this an appropriate time to? When we're talking about connectivity, we're talking right now about probably goods and individual people, but when we start talking about ideas and data and communication, mm -hmm. I mean, connectivity really transcends beyond cars and buses to broadband. Yeah. And I public mean, wifi. I think this is part of that idea that if we're really talking about connectivity, it's not just humans and goods, it's also, and that's part of the empowerment side. And a good example where you know a very good project can come under two different goals or be a part of two different goals, right. mm -hmm. and also that's an important thing to note from you know what makes a higher priority project if it's actually hitting multiple goals. But sure, broadband as a connectivity component definitely. Yeah, well, I yeah. think overarching bridging the digital divide should be an overarching issue too in all the project areas mm -hmm. as well and goals. But there's also social connectivity. I mean, if you look at the green spaces in New York City, mm -hmm. they were built to serve the people that lived in those areas. But because they were so beautiful, they became a destination. There was entertainment. There was sports. So I think there's the social connectivity also of having people combine. Yeah. The tourists are alongside the people who live here. Yeah. Similar activities. Yeah. So if we had a category of, of, of green spaces, I think connectivity would be an element of that that goal mm -hmm. um, for me, as well as, you know, public health, right, just a piece of that, right? Um, you know, those goals don't have to be projects, right? So we have, again, I disassociate that, but I think tying a project to a goal, right? We want to redo the park with Winnie, right? Because it's a great promenade for the city and it's a great gathering space and hits the goal of green space and public health and all that other stuff, right? Um, all right, so is there anything else on transportation and connectivity for, for tonight under goals? No, I don't know. I was saying, be careful with broadband because going to the state, that is a totally different bucket. It's being funded for 80 to 90 percent of private developers right now in phase three of the broadband program. If you get lost in, we like to free, you know, Wi Fi broadband, you're going to confuse what you're trying to do here with what they've already got a giant complex where we're working on it for three years project over there and part of